Hello everyone, welcome back to Act of Learning. In this video, we will be discussing about one of the amazing theorems in geometry called as Cavalieri's principle. This principle, in some sense, can be considered to be a precursor to integral calculus. We will see it in action by using it to find the area spanned by one arc of a cycloid. So, here we go. Cavalieri's principle states that if we have two regions that sit on a common base, such that lines parallel to that base intersects both regions in segments of equal length, then the two regions have equal area. The principle should be obvious, at least intuitively. To see how it works, consider a simple rectangle. If we divide this rectangle into smaller rectangles of the same width, then it should be obvious that the area of the original rectangle is the same as the sum of the areas of these smaller rectangles. The same remains true even if we horizontally move the rectangles such that the tip of the rectangles lie on a straight line or even an arbitrary curve for that matter. Cavalier's principle takes it to the extreme case. In the limiting case of almost zero height rectangles, the small rectangles become so thin the principle tells us that we can consider them as straight lines. What we now have are two shapes with a common base such that the lines parallel to the base intersects both the regions in segments of equal length. And we know that the shapes have equal area because they comprise the same rectangle just moved horizontally. The same applies irrespective of the shape we start and end with. Though the principle looks very simple, it's deceptively powerful. It was used in finding areas and volumes of geometric objects years before the idea of calculus was developed. A cycloid is a curve generated by a point on the circumference of the circle rolling on a straight line without slipping. Though it didn't launch a thousand ships, it caused frequent disputes between the 17th century mathematicians. Maybe because of its simple construction, the cycloid, amazingly, is both the brachistochrone and the tautochrone curve on a plane. Brachistochrone, in the sense that it is the curve of fastest descent for a bead sliding along a curve under the influence of gravity. Tautochrone, because irrespective of the starting point, a bead sliding on the curve will take the same amount of time to reach the curve's lowest point. One of the first questions that we can ask ourselves about a cycloid is the area spanned by one of its arches. In fact, let's deal with a slightly general situation. Rather than a cycloid for which the tracing point is on the circumference of the circle, let's consider the case where the tracing point is inside the circle. The resulting curve is one among a family of curves called the trochoid. However, to avoid confusion, let's address this curve as cycloid as well. So, reiterating, we are interested in the area spanned by one arch of the cycloid. As the arch is symmetrical, we will focus only on the first half of this arch. Now comes the interesting point. The cycloid that we are interested in was generated by the circle rolling in the clockwise direction on a straight line below it. If the same circle were to roll in the counterclockwise direction on the line above it, then the same point would trace out a different cycloid. The region between these two cycloids is the key in finding the area we want. We will use Cavalier's principle to find the area of this region. Consider the generating circle rolling simultaneously in both clockwise and the counterclockwise direction. The angle through which the circle would have rotated is the same in both the cases at any given instant. Therefore, the tracing points on either of the cycloids will be at the same height. We can also observe that the line joining these two tracing points is a card on the smaller circle. As each segment in the region between the cycloids is exactly the same length as that of the card in the smaller circle, we can conclude from Cavalier's principle that the area of this region is equal to that of the smaller circle. The rest is now simple algebra. Let A be the radius of the generating circle and B be the distance between the center and the tracing point. Then the dimensions of both the bounding yellow rectangle and the orange rectangles are obvious. We just found out that the area of the blue region is same as that of the smaller circle. Using this and the area of the orange rectangle, we can find that the area of the orange region as well. Finally, the area of the smaller yellow rectangle is easy. Now that we have everything, 
we can find the area included in one half of the cycloidal arch to be pi by 2 times 2a square plus b square and hence the area under the full arch is pi times 2a square plus b square unlike the methods of calculus we did not even need the equation of the cycloid to find its area that is something that truly blows my mind every time hope you enjoyed this discussion as well see you in the next video